than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and All right. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, Lynn. Um, and yeah, so, so like you said, I'm, I'm Justin. I've um, been working on databases for roughly 10 years now. Um, and I decided to give a talk on, to tie together kind of the last two lectures that you've had in this class about two specific systems, about OLAP, how OLAP and OLTP are done in the real world in the cloud. Um, so kind of the outline of this talk, um, you know, briefly I'll motivate the movement to the cloud. Um, you know, hopefully it doesn't need too much motivation. Um, then I'll talk about kind of two systems um, in, in roughly, you know, some detail, um, both that I've, I've worked on, well, currently work on and worked on in the past. Uh, the first is, is BigQuery, uh, which is Google Cloud's um, native cloud data warehouse. And the second one is Amazon Aurora um, in the OLTP side. And I should say, you know, I'm currently employed at Google, uh, but everything that I'm talking about today um, is, is in the public domain, has been published. Um, uh, but I'm here to essentially add more color to it. And, and please, um, during this talk, feel free to ask questions. I'm here to kind of talk about how things are done um, in practice. Um, so, so you know, you have me for an hour. Um, please ask questions. I can manage time um, and so forth. So without further ado, um, let's talk about the cloud. So, you know, once upon a time, you know, on the old side, <clears throat> um, companies like Oracle, um, you know, Teradata, you know, Pied Piper would sell you a box, right? And, um, you know, essentially a database appliance, right? And this, this hardware was, was stored, you know, in, in customers um, or, or businesses' um, on-premise data centers and, and everything worked fine, right? But, but clearly, you know, there's a shift now um, to the cloud for, for multiple reasons, right? Customers are, are shipping their kind of their data and their workloads to, to um, um, systems like BigQuery, um, Redshift and AWS, um, Synapse on, on Azure, and of course Snowflake and, and Databricks on all platforms, right? So, so why is this, right? Well, multiple reasons, right? The first is economies of scale. Right, um, the hyperscale kind of cloud providers can provide um, clearly kind of you know hardware at at at, um, at very good costs. Right, uh, the second is innovation. Right, a lot of these uh, cloud companies are now starting to build their own custom hardware and ASICs. Right, so examples of these are, are Gravitron uh, from AWS, TPUs from Google, so on and so forth. Right, so there's a lot of innovation going on kind of at the custom customization of cloud workloads between kind of hardware and software. Right, um, the third is you know operations. Right. It's really hard to operate kind of these large-scale database deployments and either data warehousing or transactional workloads at scale, right? So, you know, by consolidating operations, you know, around a single service, right, that's a huge uh, benefit for, for businesses, right? Um, the fourth is you know, security and governance and compliance, right? This is a really hard thing to, to, um, to get right. Right? And, and clearly kind of the hyperscalers have, have um, very good folks that have worked in security and governance and compliance for a long time. So being able to consolidate that in a single kind of you know, service is, is, is clearly a benefit, right? Um, the next one is you know, rich cloud ecosystems, right? So really, you know, customers move database workloads to the cloud, but, but really what they're doing is they're moving kind of all workloads to the cloud outside of databases and so forth, right? So really what they're buying into is kind of a rich ecosystem of services you know, in the cloud, right? If you look across all the kind of Azure, um, AWS, GCP, right? Um, they have you know, unique and, and kind of very large kind of AI deployment services um, security and you know, databases for OLTP, OLAP that you know will eventually just work together, right? So this is a this is another huge kind of draw for for, for large businesses as well, right? So why should any of us care, especially us in this room, right? Well, <clears throat> when you're moving and re-architecting databases, you know, to work in the cloud, there are a different set of assumptions, and this leads to different architectures. And I argue that. Really, when we're going to be done with this, you know, in the next, you know, say, you know, five to ten years, really, the, a lot of the textbook basics will have been rewritten about kind of how we think about architecting database systems and so forth. Right? And and frankly, this is an exciting area, era, you know, for the field, right? So so this is you know <clears throat> why we should care about it, and hopefully by the end of this talk, you know, you'll have I'll have shed some more light on, on on why this is interesting, right? So again, you know, ask questions as I go along. Okay, so the first system, uh, BigQuery, uh, OLAP in the cloud, right? So in a nutshell, kind of what is BigQuery, right? Um, in a sentence, it's a serverless, highly scalable, and cost-effective 
cloud data warehouse um, provided by, by GCP, right? Um, it's fully managed, um, serverless and, and clusterless, and I'll, I'll shed some light on what that means, right? Um, it's available 24 seven with a four nines uptime. Um, we really strive for predictable performance, um, and we have key features like integrated ML um, within the BigQuery umbrella itself, um, easy to use SQL with hints. Um, we have petabyte scale storage and queries um, can scale massively. Uh, data is encrypted and durable, which is important for, for enterprise customers. And we also provide kind of real-time analytics on streaming data, right? This is one of the key features of BigQuery and really a differentiator. So the BigQuery architecture, you know, looks looks as follows, right? And I'll spend you know a little bit you know of time on uh, on this one, and then and then go into some of the details here, right? Um, but BigQuery is, is truly kind of it, it separates compute and storage in a unique way, right? So you know, on one side, you know, it looks like a data warehouse um, from from the right hand side here, right? It's SQL compliant. Um, you can access you know data through REST APIs um, <clears throat> and, and issue queries. It also has a web UI and CLI. And client libraries in seven different languages, so very easy to work with, right? <clears throat> and and storage is uniquely separated from compute, right? So we have essentially a highly available cluster for for compute, the the, the components doing the query processing, uh, and this is separated from storage by a petabit bisection bandwidth network, right? Um, and and for which data at rest sits on replicated durable storage, right? And there's also a kind of unique distributed um, memory shuffle tier in beneath. Uh, or sorry, um, in between uh, these components for for doing shuffles for massive you know queries and so forth, right? And we also support streaming ingest and read um, directly to storage, which is quite unique for BigQuery, um, and also bulk, bulk load and export, right? So that's the basic overview of how, how BigQuery is architected. All right. So some of the architectural design principles that BigQuery follows is. is um, Clear storage and compute, um, clean separation. So again, petabyte scale storage, um, highly available compute, and it's serverless and, and completely serverless and multi-tenant, right? Um, we also aim for co-location and caching where possible for high performance and low cost. Um, and we have a nicely integrated hardware and software stack. So take advantage of key hardware primitives um, where, where, where necessary um, for high performance and, and low cost. All right, so this is you know roughly what a what a query looks like in BigQuery, right? So you know if you were to issue a query in BigQuery, you know, we'd set up a, a, a distributed kind of um, query graph um, where data at rest in a distributed file system is first scanned by a set of workers. Um, if it requires kind of reshuffling, um, there's a shuffle tier. Um, another set of workers in the next stage will process it again, um, send it to shuffle, um, where a final worker, say in stage three here. Um, finalizes the query and writes the results to a distributed file system, right? And to be able to coordinate this, there's a separate coordinator component um, and a scheduler to, to um, pr essentially provide the resources to answer the query. So any questions here? Are we good? Yep. Can you talk more about the in-memory shuffle? Yes, I have a couple slides on, on, on shuffle. So, oh, the, the question was, uh, can we provide more details on shuffle? Yes, yeah, we can. In the um, in the subsequent slides. Yep. Okay. So what I'm saying, what I'm like seeing from this slide is that a query comes in, right? Mm -hmm. And then, like, where does it go first? Because I don't see like an error when like the query comes in. And right. Because I think I missed. Right, okay, so the life of a query starts at the coordinator, where essentially it'll parse the query, plan it out, right? And at that point, a set of resources is, is provisioned, right? These workers are provisioned, right, to answer the query. And, you know, in kind of typical massive MPP kind of style, the query is answered in a distributed manner, right? And, and I'll get into more details of how exactly this works and, and what happens behind the scenes. But yeah, that's the, essentially, yes, uh, it's, uh, the query comes in, it's planned, um, the graph is, is set um, with the actual work that's to be done, and data flows from essentially left to right in this graph. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, before I go on though, right, a, a key piece of, of, um, of BigQuery is that it's built the Google way, right? And, and by being built the Google way, what I mean is that it's a set of, you know, what BigQuery really is, is a, it's a set of infrastructure and components um, built around kind of Google's core infrastructure, right? So, you know, I'm happy to provide references after the class, but, um, you know, the distributed storage tier is, is Colossus, uh, which is Google's, you know, uh, global scalable storage system. Um, all com essentially all jobs, all resources are provisioned by Borg. Um, which there's a very nice paper, I think, you know, back in 2015 written on you know, what Borg does and, and 
how it works. And I think John Wilkes has visited here and given talks on it as well. Um, it's also based on Dremel. Um, Dremel uh, was a paper published you know, back in 2010, um, back when Dremel was um, internal Google infrastructure for, for essentially querying logs data and so forth. Um, it also relies on you know, pieces of spanner um, to store kind of state as well. Um, and the, the petabit bisection bandwidth network is actually you know, Jupyter. And there's a nice, um, I think, SIGCOM paper uh, written on this as well, right? So the key here is that you know, not only is it the set of components that make up a, a, a kind of a cloud data warehouse, but it's heavily based on you know, the use of, of BigQuery, or uh, sorry, Google, Google infrastructure as well. And it allows us to make kind of different architectural assumptions about how the system is built, what assumptions we can make about kind of the underlying primitives that we use for other infrastructure as well, right? Uh, but one I want to talk on, you know, a bit more is Borg, right? <clears throat> so this really enables BigQuery to have, you know, serverless, archi uh, serverless architecture at scale, like truly serverless, right? So, so the basics of Borg is that any compute at Google, um, uh, any resource allocation is more or less done through Borg, right? And essentially you tell Borg, um, you know, what set of kind of primitives you want for resources, how much CPU, um, how much memory and so forth, and some config. Um, you package up a container and you hand it to Borg and it'll place it on a machine in the data center for you, right? So Borg is able to shape compute and resources in unique ways, right? You're able to use exactly what you want. Borg will figure out where to fit it and bin pack it, you know, on, on physical machines and you go from there. <laughs> I highly recommend reading this paper if, if you hadn't. Right. So if you look at kind of a comparison of how you, know, you would build the cloud data warehouse across kind of, you know, when you say like the large, um, you know, uh, the, the kind of cloud providers, right? Usually what you do um, is use kind of a VM cluster of a, as a primitive, right? So, you know, if in terms of Azure uh, data warehouse, right, they have SQL server running alongside local storage and a VM cluster. They also have clusters for Spark and, and data, you know, can reside on Azure storage or Azure data lake storage and so forth, right? But really the primitive here is kind of the VM cluster boundary, right? <clears throat> in BigQuery, we don't need to worry about that due to Borg, right? Essentially, we have a set of jobs, you know, for our metadata, um, for our storage APIs, a stream ingest, um, kind of storage, man storage management tasks, data residing on Colossus, and, and kind of Dremel, again, the Dremel workers shipping as their own kind of set of, set of compute and so forth, right? So really, it's a, you know, we're able to, essentially, this is essentially a picture that says BigQuery is truly able to you know, be kind of a, a serverless architecture relying on Borg for, for compute. So you know, what's the serverless design principles and, and advantages? Well, again, the disaggregation of compute, storage, and memory is key. Right? This allows us to essentially scale on demand each set of resources, so both compute and storage separately. Um, it allows on-demand sharing of uh, resources, right? And this adapts well to a truly kind of multi-tenant usage, which allows us to provide lower costs at the end of the day, right? <clears throat> so um, it also allows for fault tolerance and restartability of, of BigQuery jobs. So, you know, at scale, and especially at Google's and, and kind of large deployments of, of data warehouses at scale, you assume everything is eventually kind of unreliable and slow, right? So query subtasks, um, are, are designed to be deterministic and repeatable, um, and even multiple copies of the same task can be dispatched uh, to avoid the straggler problem, right? Um, <clears throat> so so um, compute uh, is provided in, in what we call you know, slots, which are virtual scheduling units. So really, you know, it's an abstract unit of compute and memory um, that, that the customer sees. And this maps well to kind of Borg, um, to supporting the flexible resource shapes that you're able to provide, right? And this really allows us to decouple kind of customer visible resources um, from the actual kind of machines, VMs, et cetera, that are being used underneath the hood um, to provide query processing, right? Um, and we also allow, you know, we built centralized scheduling. Um, so this allows us, our scheduler, um, to have a global view of the entire service state, right? To be able to make, you know, semi-optimal decisions um, about, about how to schedule jobs, um, how, to, how to schedule compute um, slots and so forth. Um, and, you know, really make the best decisions for utilization, isolation, and kind of running the service. It also allows for kind of flexible query execution, right? So, <clears throat> Again, going back to the original question, kind of the life of a query, you know, happens again in this in this diagram from top to bottom, right? At the top, there's a coordinator, right? It's the first to receive a query. Um, it builds an execution plan, um, which is you know really a, a directed graph of, of execution trees, right? 
uh, and it orchestrates and executes um, with workers to provide and provided by the scheduler, right? So the scheduler will provide the compute, right, and, and to the plan, and will deploy essentially the query at that point, right? And workers um, are really allocated as a pool uh, without any predefined structure, right? So these are essentially Borg jobs um, that, that we pool, um, and come query time, um, the scheduler will you know, give a query a set of workers, and after planning coordination, the coordinator sends the workers essentially ready to execute query plan, kind of their piece, their sub plan, their piece of the query to go off and execute, right? So in this case, so before I go on, are there any, any questions here? Is this, is this pretty clear? Good question. The execution, the execution plan is complete. Oh, uh, does, does the existence of Borg make it hard to kind of plan the query? No, it's typical kind of query planning and, and optimization. Right. Once you're ready to execute the query, I mean, the scheduler will provide the workers and you essentially parallelize that way. So was the question is around co-location and SLAs? Yeah, so if you're like allocating multiple containers, let's say that process is that. Now that would have some sort of performance Again, this is, this is where the network comes into play. Oh, it does, does, does allocating kind of too many workers um, in different places affect yeah. query processing, yeah. right, right? Right, so queries, queries don't necessarily have SLAs, right? We have, we have predictable performance, and what provides predictable performance is the assumption of a petabit bisection bandwidth network, and what we're able to read off Colossus and so forth. You should explain what predictable performance is. Oh, oh and predict, by predictable performance, I mean, um, you know, you issue, you know, a set of queries, the same query over and over again, you know, get roughly the same, same performance. Exactly, exactly. No, very little variance, that what we, that's what we strive for. Right. Why does that matter? Customers, uh, and yes, why does it matter? Above all, um, especially large enterprise customers demand um, predictability over everything else. Um, that's, that's one thing that's, that's we've seen fairly true over and over again. So they're, they're willing for it to run slower as long as it runs at the same time. Same, right. Same speed every time. Exactly. Right. But like, why? Like, right. why is it important to be predictable for even like large enterprise customers? Why, why is it? Why? Because if customers, if, well, if customers see, you know, if they have a workload, uh, say 10 queries, right? If one gets faster but nine gets slower, right? They'll take the predictability of everything going the, kind of the same speed as, as one getting faster and nine getting slower. Right. Another way to think about it, like, you're not, think of like not somebody writing the terminal over and over again, think of like a program, right? So some, some, some application is just saying, run this query. And then today it's slow, tomorrow it's fast, and you're like, is it my application? Is it the database? Oh, I see. It's right. one less thing you have to worry about. Exactly. Right. Right. All right. So in this case, you know, say we have this query um, that we that we send that's executed in three stages. Um, the, the the bottom workers here would be scanning the data from, from distributed storage, applying a partial group by. Um, and then, then go to shuffle um, that, that provides kind of dynamic partitioning for us um, into the next stage, which is doing the group by sort and limit. Um, then piped into the final stage, which is doing the final kind of sort and, and top K limit um, to answer the query. So that's a kind of a basic flow of how things work. Okay, in memory shuffle, right? So, <clears throat> um, I mean, this is the basic overview of, of, of in memory shuffle, right? So, so BigQuery uses um, essentially a, a separate storage tier. This is a kind of a design decision that was actually you know, just described in the VLDB um, 10 year best, best paper award for, for Dremel, right? Um, and the basics are as follow, right? So in memory shuffle, you know, a, in memory shuffle isn't necessarily new, but in memory, it's a, but, but the key finding is that in memory shuffle coupled with kind of coupled with compute presents bottlenecks, right? It's hard to mitigate kind of quadratic scaling characteristics of, of shuffle. Um, and it leads to resource fragmentation, um, you know, stranding, you know, some memory and poor isolation, frankly, right? So BigQuery actually implements, you know, on top of separate compute and storage, um, disaggregated memory-based shuffle, right? So this is RAM disk managed separately from the compute tier, right? And it is found to reduce shuffle latency by an order of magnitude, um, enable, enables order of magnitude larger shuffles, um, and reduced resource costs by, by 20%. Right? So this is, this is a key, you know, piece of, key piece of the stack, right? 
Um, and it also added persistence in the shuffle layer, right? And so this allows kind of stages of the query to be checkpointed, right? And it allows, it's really the key piece to allow flexible kind of scheduling and execution, right? So BigQuery can preempt workers after checkpointing, you know, state, kind of re-optimize and add a new set of workers or, or reduce the set of workers in the next stage um, based on how it sees the query being executed. All right, so this is all done through dynamic scheduling uh, in BigQuery, right? So the dynamic, you know, central scheduler allocates both slots uh, and the number of workers uh, to be done. Again, slots are the kind of the virtual compute unit um, used in BigQuery, right? So it's, it's used to handle machine failure. So if a machine, you know, fails, it's able to spin up another one after um, state is checkpointed to, to kind of redo the work. Um, and it also allows fair distribution of, of resources between queries, right? So if we see this graph here, you know, query one is executing, query one, two, three, and four are executing at a certain, certain point. At a certain point, you know, it's found that query four needs less resources, right? So the scheduler can, can reduce, um, uh, and then the workload manager can reduce the resources used and, and provide those resources to another query um, so they can all finish it roughly at the same time. And, and so, why do you need dynamic query execution, right? So um, if, if folks you know, don't know who this person is, is David DeWitt, um, famous for the DeWitt Clause and many other things in the database industry um, and, and academia and so forth. Um, and he gave an, an interview um, a while back, I think late 90s, early 2000s, to the Sigmon record, right? Back when he was working on query optimization and, and dynamic query optimization and re-optimization. And, and you know, he, he provides a kind of a pithy answer to a question here, but it, but it kind of rings true, right? So optimizers are making assumptions about joins five or six levels up in the tree just based on wishful thinking, right? So if you have a large enough query kind of with a large enough number of joins, right, there's no way you can, you know, reliably predict what's going to come out, like, you know, six to seven levels up in the join tree and so forth, right? So BigQuery um, uh, enables, you know, on top of dynamic scheduling, dynamic query execution as well, right? And this is a kind of a key piece that we use. So the goal here is dynamic, so, so the first piece here is dynamic partitioning, right? So the goal here is dynamic to essentially load balance and adjust parallelism, you know, while adapting to any query data shape or size, right? So, so the planner and optimizer is actually quite primitive. Um, we, and we rely heavily on <clears throat> um, these dynamic query, um, query execution pieces um, to, for predictability and performance, right? So, you know, in the example here, right, say we have workers start writing to partitions one and two, at a certain point, the coordinator detects that there's actually too much data going to partition two. It'll actually dynamically repartition on the fly to partition three and four. At that point, workers stop writing to partition two, start writing to position, uh, um, partition three and four, and data in partition two is repartitioned into three and four as well uh, to provide better kind of um, smoothness in the, in the partition stream for consumption by the next, next stage. Um, we also make uh, use of kind of join reoptimization. So just briefly, a broadcast join. Um, you know, if you if you learned about that in this class, um, this is where you know one worker, if the if the kind of one side of the table is small enough, it can be broadcast to the other workers, and the join can be done um, on those on the on the broadcast of the of the other worker nodes that receive the join or receive the the smaller side of the table. And shuffle join. You know, if both sides of the join are large enough. Um, it'll completely re use shuffle or repartition um, to be able to execute the join kind of in parallel after shuffle, right? <clears throat> so BigQuery takes advantage of dynamic join processing as follows. What percentage of all the join queries on BigQuery is used to use like the shuffle join broadcast join? How common are they? I, I don't know that. I don't know the answer. Sorry. Um, so, you know, in this case, so in a simple example, you know, we can start with a hash join, you know, by shuffling data on both sides. Um, and you can actually cancel the shuffle on one, if one side finishes fast, um, and it's essentially below a broadcast size threshold, right? At, at which case, you know, it'll start executing a broadcast join uh, instead, right? Which leads to much less data transferred, usually better performance, so on and so forth, right? So this, this is an example of where BigQuery can take advantage of kind of the, the kind of the re-optimization on the fly um, to switch to switch to a broadcast join, right? Um, it can also decide the number of partitions workers for a parallel join based on the input data sizes. Um, occasionally swap join sides in certain cases, and there are also star schema join optimizations that it takes advantage of. Pretty typical stuff. Okay, um, at this point I'll go into kind of more, um, kind of other kind of key features of, of BigQuery, um, but it's kind of the, the overall kind of query processing flow, you know, fairly clear um, about what's going on here. Any questions? 
Good? Okay. Okay, the first feature I'd like to talk about is uh, a capacitor, right? And this is, this is BigQuery's columnar format, you know, like every other large scale data warehouse, um, data in BigQuery is stored columnarly um, for, for read optimized, in a read optimized format, right? And, you know, a couple of the key features around capacitor, right, is that, and, and also there's an interesting blog post written by Moshe, um, who is an, was an engineer on the team, um, written back in 2016 on details here, which is, again, very interesting. Um, and, and essentially the key features here are that evaluation, there's an evaluation, uh, uh, vectorized evaluation is embedded in the data access library to push compute and as close to the data uh, as possible, right? And it provides certain things like, you know, typical partition and predicate pruning, um, vectorization as close to the data as possible. Um, capacitor makes use of skip indexes um, within the file um, to be able to do, you know, efficient data skipping. Um, and then also reorder predicates um, using certain heuristics for things like dictionary usage, um, unique cardinality, va unique value cardinality, uh, null density of the data, and expression complexity. Right. Right. Um, and it also provides kind of row reordering, right? So underneath the hood, I know it can reorder data to, in this case, to take care of, um, um, take advantage of run length encoding, right? So on the on the left here, you know, originally, you know, data is loaded in um, kind of the following, you know, format in which, um, you know, say, you know, run length encoding for the items column, you know, there's not being, you can't take advantage of run length encoding, right? Um, capacitor will actually reorder the data, um, say that in this case, um, you know, the state quarter and, and, and item columns um, to be able to lay out the data such that, you know, run length encoding can actually be applied to the data um, to be compressed um, even even further, right? And this is a kind of a graph from the recent VLDB paper that was that was written on Dremel um, that shows, you know, in, in kind of for real data sets in BigQuery, uh, the percentage of bytes saved by being able to kind of reorder the data to take care of, um, you know, take advantage of, of uh, compression in run length encoding and so forth. So layout matters. When do you guys actually use compression? Like where? Oh, it'll, it's, uh, it can be continuously you know, compressed behind the scenes. Um, and, and BigQuery also favors clustering. Um, so it provides kind of the ability to automatically recluster data too. So, you know, if you define a table on, on being able to say like, you know, I want to cluster um, data by this column and this column, um, we will the BigQuery will automatically recluster the data. Um, so in this case, you know, block one um, has all the customer IDs clustered, you know, on, on, on ID one, um, block three to four and so forth, right? So this allows you know advantageous advantage, um, advantages in, in query processing such as data skipping, um, co-location if you're computing aggregates, um, it's a huge win there, um, and also allows, it allows for optimizations over star schemas and so forth, right? How does it affect the state performance? If you're in the background you're compressing, like if I run my query today, mm -hmm. compress and I tomorrow run faster. Not right, well, so, I mean, think about, like, if you have new rows, like, added to the table, right, you want to automatically recluster the data to, begin to, to take advantage of it. And this is where, you know, behind the scenes, I won't get into details here, but, um, you know, if, you, if new data is added to, the, added to the system, right, added to a table, um, yeah, for a certain amount of time, you know, that data, they'll be, you know, semi-unclustered, right, the kind of the delta that was added to the table. But over time, yes, it'll eventually be reclustered, right. So it'll make things go faster, never slower. You didn't mention this, what is the pricing model for BigQuery? Like how do you make money? Do you charge per query, per data read, per data transfer? Right, so there's two, there's two models for, for charging for BigQuery. The customers reserve slots, um, or they can pay on demand okay. for the slots used to answer a query, up okay. to some limit. Pay for compute. Yeah, uh, for a slot. So, yeah, slot is a, essentially, think of it as an abstract resource. Okay. Yeah. Right. It's a similar model, you know, used in other, you know, queries like like uh, Cosmos DB actually in Azure uses something similar, um, kind of some kind of unit, right, of, of resources used to answer a query. If you, if you compress data, I think the query runs faster. Uh, Customers pay less. Oh, they do pay less. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Um, so going back to this slide, uh, you said that you know you present uh, you present like a serverless abstraction. Right. Right. Uh, but underneath the hood, how do you capture uh, locality, uh, like such as this? You know, is, is this done in? Is this like encoded into like outboard? So, so this is really. I mean, take this is you know, take the serverless aspect out of this. Like, oh, sorry. The the question was, um, 
how do you, uh, given the serverless architecture, um, can you? Okay, yeah, yeah. Like, like given the view that you present to the customers, the yeah. server, underneath the hood, how do you actually capture locality? Is in, is in automatic reclustering? Well, or? Well, just, you know, when you're like scheduling jobs inside of four, right. um, how do you represent, you know, things like, uh, oh, this is plus this is plus. So, so, so the question is, you know, given the server lifts abstract and abstraction, how do, you, how do you handle locality, right? But for the clustering question, uh, there's also a question about, about clustering and locality, right? Clustering is a, is a property of a data layout. In this case, in this case, you know, if, if there's new data added to a table, right? Eventually, you want it to be clustered and sorted according to how how the customer specified, right? Um, so yeah, you have to take care of essentially the new data that was added to the table um, to, to provide essentially, um, you know, and, and and essentially by nature that data the the similar columns will be co-located, right? At that point, because it's essentially a data sorting problem. Section bandwidth network and provides a lot of advantages, right? But yeah, I mean, there is certain caching like in the system, you know, at the storage tier and so forth, right? But but you know, nothing in particular at the at the worker nodes. Um, this assumption will change when I talk about the BI engine. But um, another key kind of feature um, that was actually just published in VLDB by by Pavan and Moshe um, is actually you know quite interesting, and this is this is you know what we term big metadata, right? And, and um, you know, just to set up the problem, you know, there's a difference you know, here to delineate between logical and physical metadata, right? Logical metadata tends to be small. And, and by logical metadata, I mean you know, things like uh, uh, um, uh, metadata that defines a schema of a table or row and column access policies and so forth, right? Physical metadata, which tends to be much larger, um, refers to things you know, that, that a query processor needs to actually go and execute a query, right? Things like file locations. Um, uh, multi, uh, uh, multi-value concurrency control, like info about um, the data um, to read snapshots, um, column stats, so on and so forth, right? So, you know, how big does this actually get, right? Well, the paper recently referenced, you know, you know BigQuery can see, pay, uh, uh, um, you know, metadata in the tens of terabytes, right, um, for certain tables, right, which can add tens of minutes of latency um, just to load metadata before processing a query, right? So the main idea of big metadata um, is to treat metadata management you know, as a data management problem, right? So, so <clears throat> what big metadata does is it organizes you know, the physical metadata of each table as a set of system tables, which itself is stored columnarly, um, that are derived from the original table, right? And you know, this is built for both batch and streaming workloads that, that BigQuery supports, right? And during query processing, you know, we defer the reading of the physical metadata for the tables until the, you know, the, the query is actually dispatched um, to the parallel partition, um, to the parallel workers, right? So the query planner first uses you know, essentially only the logical metadata um, to generate a query plan with you know, typical things like constant folding, um, filter pushdown, so on and so forth, right? And then the query is rewritten kind of effectively as a semi-join um, of the original query, kind of with the metadata system table now, you know, as part of the query, right? Which effectively produces a list of, of block locators, file locations that, that the query will actually need to read, right? So this is a way of, of, of essentially treating kind of the physical metadata problem as itself kind of a, a, a just another query or, or part of the query, right? And there are a bunch of details in the paper. Um, I, I, I highly suggest you go read it to see how kind of the state of the art in big metadata management is, is handled. Okay. So BigQuery also supports um, read and write APIs directly um, to, to manage storage, or what, what BigQuery terms are, are storage tier, right? So on top of Drenimal, which, which accesses data on Colossus, you know, more or less directly, um, we also have um, high throughput read and write APIs kind of in both directions. So, so um, engines like Spark, um, TensorFlow, Presto, or, or Google Dataflow um, can read and write data um, to and from data, to, to and from storage directly, right? 
And again, you know, this is roughly the kind of the, the control flow, but really this, this speaks to how BigQuery is architected and that, you know, to be able to serve kind of parallel table reads or writes, right? Metadata, you know, is a separate component on top of kind of capacitor stream ingest, um, yeah, capacitor um, on Colossus, that should be Colossus, stream ingest components, um, and Dremel is completely, you know, separate as well, right? So we're able to provide this kind of high performance storage tier directly to um, other engines as well. So in terms of the read API, um, we support multiple streams um, to read data in parallel. So you can read essentially a disjoint set of rows across kind of multiple tables in parallel. And this really you know, facilitates consumption of parallel processing by other query processing frameworks, say such as Spark. Right? Um, we allow column projections and filtering. Um, so we read only the data that's necessary. And there's vectorized query processing that's pushed as close to the data under the API as possible. Um, and we also allow snapshot consistency. So consistent, um, it, by default, a read is consistent as the point of time in, in the start of the session, the read session um, that, that, that the, the engine sets up. Or you can read a, a session um, uh, um, snapshot as a, you know, a, a prior timestamp or so forth. Um, the write API, um, we, we just um, sent into GA, um, you know, really supports the best in the industry stream ingest um, at scale. Right, directly to, to, to manage storage. Um, some key features here is that it provides exactly one semantics, um, which is you know, actually a key feature for, for stream ingest and in other kind of scenarios customers want to build on top of streaming. Um, it provides both stream level and cross stream transactions, which again is key. So streams um, can commit kind of as a single transaction um, and retry and abort failure. I kind of we handle the, the transactional semantics across that. Um, and again, a key feature that you know a lot of customers have started using is committing data across parallel streams, right? So you can you know write across parallel streams and have it commit as a single transaction, which is fairly key. Right, right, yeah. So, in, so Andy asked, you might want to you know, describe what, what stream is. Yeah, it's not simply an insert statement. This is essentially starting with append only, right? Streaming data into the engine. Um, um, into storage directly, right? Um, and it also provides kind of schema update detection for schema evolution, so on and so forth. Yep. Right. Um, effectively, you know, if you think of how, you know, such a system is set up naturally, like, you know, data is ingested and ultimately, you know, it lands in some sort of, um, you know, read optimized format eventually, right? So there's a log structure and merge process that goes on there. Yeah, question? No, it's a, it's a property of um, you know the, the so the question is um, how do you support column projection in the read API, right? Um, it's a property of kind of the read session, right? So so we assume that the the, the engine issuing um, the parallel scan, you know, does about table schema and is able to ask us for what what um, what what columns need to be read from the data. Yeah, ultimately when it's time to access the data, um, we have that projection um, and, and are able to you know, essentially just open up the file and read the columns that are necessary. Same with filters and push down as well, push as close to the data as possible. And those are provided through expressions. Any other questions? Okay. Um, that was actually, you know, an, an, another key feature that we that we just built into BigQuery is, is an embedded BI engine, and this is actually, you know, fairly exciting. Um, so, you know, a lot of a lot of um, um, analytics queries tend to be repeatable uh, and and you know, it, um, um, issued from kind of a BI tool such as Looker or, or yeah, Power BI. BI oh, BI stands for Business Intelligence, right? And these are usually things like dashboards, um, people building kind of um, queries or dashboards into uh, BI tools like Power BI, Looker. Um, these are all popular kind of BI tools, right? Um, so what this means is that these, these queries are usually canned, um, usually short-lived, um, don't change that often, right? Um, and um, really kind of require kind of a, a different set of assumptions. Like they tend not to be super large scale, right? So <clears throat> BigQuery, you know, if you look at kind of what it, what it provides in terms of um, um, feature sets for answering kind of, kind of query caching or, or kind of advanced um, kind of performance and so forth, um, 
at the very base, you know, you can look at things like partitioning and clustering of the data is, is being able to speed up queries um, to take advantage of partition skipping or, or clustering, um, skipping of the data and read only what you need. On top of that, we provide, BigQuery provides materialized views um, for sort of materializing kind of either subqueries or, or, or whole queries um, for use in kind of query optimization and so forth. And at the very top, um, we're able to cache data in, in what we call the BI engine. And this is really an in-memory, it provides kind of in-memory a uh, vectorized query engine for low latency and, and really high concurrency, right? So here, data is cached in memory. Um, there's a vectorized query engine sitting close to that data in memory um, and it's able to answer queries in kind of sub-second you know, latencies. Yep. So your materialized views, are you sort of able to incrementally update those or just periodically them? Yeah, the question is, are materialized views incrementally updatable? The answer is yes. Right. And you know, if you look at the right hand side here, right, there's a different use cases for different types of data, right? So at the very bottom, you know, cold petabyte style or petabyte size, um, you know, uh, scans and queries, you know, go through our you know high throughput um, you know, uh, scans in, in Dremel, um, warms, uh, you know, the warm tier is roughly hundreds of terabytes. Hot for materialized views tends to be you know tens of terabytes, and very hot, you know, an order of gigabytes close to a terabyte. So that's what we're talking about in terms of data sizes here. And if we're to redraw kind of the BigQuery architecture here, right, the BI engine, again, you can think of it as a set of, um, of um, in this term, stateful workers, right? So here's where data is cached in memory. Um, there's a vectorized query engine sitting close to the data to be able to uh, um, efficiently answer queries that are you know, memory bound and take advantage of all kind of the <clears throat> uh, neat vectorization tricks you can do on, on, for, for query processing. All right, and in terms of, this is another way of looking at the BI engine architecture, right? Again, you know, built on existing BigQuery storage, nothing has really changed there. Um, but, you know, really, it's also ability, you know, if you look at B the BI engine um, coupled with our streaming ingest, it really needs, it eliminates the need to, to manage kind of BI servers, a separate set of BI servers, kind of in a middle tier or so forth. This is completely embedded, embedded within kind of the query processing framework of, of BigQuery. Uh, and then you can eliminate things like ETL pipelines or complex extracts. Just stream the data directly into BigQuery, um, can update materialized views, or again, cache it in the BI engine for, for fast updates, right? And again, no, no need to manage um, traditional OLAP cubes and so forth. We don't use cubes anymore. Good. <laughs> so just disregard what cubes mean. Um, another neat feature that we've had um, uh, two years um, is, is BigQuery ML, right? And, and Big, BigQuery was actually a, a pioneer in this space of, of really kind of democratizing kind of ML features and pushing them into the data warehouse um, itself, right? So you know, in terms of, kind of what, we, what we provide in terms of ML model building, um, we provide you know, the ability to do classification, kind of logistic regression, um, DNN, and auto, what we call auto ML tables for um, Vertex AI. That's another, this is the AI um, portion of, of GCP or services, um, linear regression, and so forth, right? Um, so for some of these, you can build the model directly in, in, in BigQuery using Dremel. Um, and we also provide import of TensorFlow models that are more kind of advanced that you want to import into BigQuery um, and do bulk, um, <clears throat> uh, bulk prediction on, right? Um, and, and basically, the key here is the ability to use SQL to do all of this. So you're able to essentially you know, build um, complex ML pipelines using SQL and work with it alongside your traditional kind of uh, data already residing in BigQuery. We also recently released BigQuery Omni, um, which is shipping, which is BigQuery shipping on other clouds, right? So starting with AWS, right? So, and the basic idea here is that, you know, the, the left-hand side is, is BigQuery running on Google Cloud, right? Um, we provide essentially the, the, the control plane um, is able to talk to essentially Dremel in, in our distributed memory shuffle tier um, that lives on AWS itself, right? So here, you know, it's powered by, you know, key pieces of Anthos, um, which we're able to ship essentially our containerization and, and you know, resource consumption on other clouds. Um, and here, the setup would be, you know, customers with large data lakes on AWS um, were able to, you know, AWS and query it there and, and send the um, results back to either GCP or, or answer it directly. What do you mean by ship compute? Uh, so, so in this case, it's, uh, I think the computation is done uh, inside the query or? 
Right. So, so here, this is really essentially in our um, that made us the source demo and the the memory the shuffle tier. Um, itself is to the customer data on AWS accessible. That's the that's the setup here, right? So Dremel, it's essentially we're able to ship Dremel and, and Shuffle um, on 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 other clouds, right? And and tied together by the control plane, um, the BigQuery control plane that crosses and essentially both Google Cloud and AWS in this case. Okay. Uh, so how am I doing on time? Um, about almost half an hour. Half an hour. Okay. All right. So you know that was that's it for for BigQuery. Um, uh, and, you know, hopefully, you know, been able to essentially relate kind of you know how you know at least one um, major <clears throat> cloud data warehouse is architected and kind of what the architectural assumptions are and so forth. Um, before I move on, are there any other any other questions? Okay. So let's talk about you know briefly about Aurora, right? And so we're switching tracks to talk about you know how OLTP, you know how some assumptions change when OLTP is done uh, in the cloud as well. Right? So if you think about how you know, traditional relational databases you know are built, right? Um, it tended to be tightly coupled, right? So SQL transactions, caching, logging um, was all kind of co-located you know on attached storage. That was always kind of the fundamental assumption of relational database architectures going back kind of 30 years and so forth, right? Um, but this is mo like rather monolithic. And, and here we're switching towards, you know, more, you know, away from OLAP um, and data warehousing, which is heavily read mostly um, to where kind of writes and operational workloads are in the picture now, right? So really a different set of assumptions at this point, right? But, but you know, traditional relational databases, you know, if, if you were to ship them in the cloud, say on, on, you know, on VMs and so forth, like this monolithic architecture, you know, has a rather large kind of blast, blast radius if something were to go, you know, so wrong, right? If the, you know, the database crashed and so forth, right? Um, and you know, it would require a lot of time and, and energy for kind of you know high availability, failover, so on and so forth, right? So when you think about you know shipping an OLTP database in the cloud, you know one you know one set of things to think about is you know again, compute and storage have different lifetimes, right? Com com storage is kind of the durable piece. Um, compute um, you know is needed you know on a on a on a varied basis, right? Instances fail, uh, you can shut them down or you can scale them up and down uh, depending on what kind of workload that you want. And instances can also be added to a cluster, right? For things like read scale and so forth, right? So again, you know, much like, um, you know, the architectural principle of, of BigQuery and Dremel, right? Um, compute and storage, even for OLTP, are best decoupled for things like scalability, availability, and durability. You know, all of which like customers buy um, when you when you are providing a essentially a, a OLTP relational database service to them, right? So, and again, IO flow uh, is, a, is a you know is another major bottleneck, right? Um, so, you know, as you might have learned in this class, databases write data twice, actually. Right? First to the write ahead log, um, which is the durability, provides the durability part of transactions. Uh, then again, uh, the data is rewritten when data is checkpointed pages back to back to storage, right? So if you look at it from kind of, and this is just a you know simple example of a MySQL instance on RDS. Um, RDS is AWS's relational database service, but it's the same if it were shipping in any any other VM on Azure or GCP, right? Um, there's a heavy I/O flow if you have a primary and, and standby instance, right? So you know, the write-ahead log <clears throat> and maybe logical log is shipped you know, a, a, to the secondary index. Um, uh, pages are checkpointed back to EBS in this case, the attached cloud disk, um, and there's also underneath the hood an EBS mirror, right? So there's a lot of I/O <clears throat> going on in this picture, right? So what Aurora, the, the architecture of Aurora, uh, Aurora. Um, you know, is essentially really looked at um, essentially having a hosting, um, you know, typical MySQL or Postgres instance, right? But really cutting out kind of the, the extra need to kind of write, really essentially optimizing the stream of IO around kind of OLTP workloads, right? So really the principles here were essentially, you know, at the database tier or what you see as the compute tier, right? Um, the database tier writes the redo log to the network, 
um, over to uh, attached, uh, or essentially a shared disk, um, um, the abstraction of a shared disk uh, in a custom storage tier, and which I'll talk about in a little bit, right? There's no checkpointing, right? As we know, the log is the database, so it's really just writing the log, um, the write ahead log to storage, no need to checkpoint pages back to storage, right? And really, log application uh, is pushed to parallel storage where it's applied to pages in parallel, right? So you can think of kind of the storage tier in Aurora as being a, um, essentially a redo log machine. Um, each piece of storage is receiving the piece of the log um, for the pages that it manages, and essentially just redoing the log um, on top of those to bring it up to date, right? And the master in this case can, can um, replicate to the read replicas uh, and where it uh, updates its cache, right? So in this case, the master is receiving the writes. Um, you can stand up um, read replicas for read scale. Uh, the master will replicate the write-ahead log and the read, <clears throat> the read replicas will just apply um, the, the portions of the log that apply to its buffer pool and drop the rest of the updates since it can always read them from shared storage, right? So really what you're looking at here is, is you know, a set of replicas attached to one large shared disk. Think of it that way, right? The storage tier is, is custom built. Um, it's highly parallel. Uh, it provides essentially highly parallel scale out redo processing um, on top of database pages, right? And data is replicated six ways uh, across three availability zones. So an availability zone, at least in AWS, is um, you know, in the same region, but, but separa uh, separated for um, availability purposes um, and kind of um, uh, disasters and so forth, right? Um, it can generate and materialize database pages on demand, right, as of a certain version. Um, and it essentially provides instant database redo recovery, right? So, so think of it as a, yeah, essentially a redo machine, right? And it provides um, six, four of six write quorum um, with local tracking, right? So this is able to provide, you know, if a whole availability zone um, uh, plus one extra replica went down, it would still be available for, for um, read quorum, right? <clears throat> so one of the advantages here is, is read scale, right? Um, again, in the, in the typical kind of high availability model where the log is shipped to the secondary and data has to be rewritten um, and transactions have to be reprocessed and so forth, um, you're able to essentially you know, shut, remove this path altogether, right? Um, just the page cache is updated on the read replicas. Um, you know, th these updates are physical using delta changes on top of, of, top of the pages. Um, there's no writes on the replica. Um, it can read data directly from shared storage if it needs to answer a query as of some point of time. So is that is kind of the basic architecture fairly clear? Any any questions here? Really, I mean, if there's one if there's one point to take away from this is that um, essentially, if you think of it as the database tier is is um, is there's no durable piece um, necessary here for transaction processing. It's all essentially pushed to um, a scale out, highly available storage tier. And okay, in terms of, of you know why six copies are necessary uh, in, in quorum, right? In a large fleet, you know, of, of anything, like like I said before, you know, failures are really background noise. The failures are happening all the time, right? So Aurora, one design principle was to you know, tolerate AZ plus one failures. So you can again, a whole entire availability zone goes down um, plus one extra replica. You, the, the the service is still available. So above all, it's a highly available OLTP system, right? <clears throat> so for, for three AZs, um, availability zones, uh, data is replicated six ways with two copies in, in each AZ, right? And this provides a write quorum of four of six and a read quorum of, of three of six. Right. <clears throat> so storage essentially segments data, segments data into you know, certain segment chunks, right? Um, so it partitions you know, a volume, essentially a, a, a storage volume into N segments, uh, which are, these are the, essentially the, the units of, of replication, right? Um, and six replicas are called, are, um, are form what's called a protection group. Um, so you know, really the, the key here is to, you know, what is the Goldilocks segment size? What's the right size for a segment, right? If segments are too small, right, and then failures can happen more often, you're moving more data along, around, right? But you know, if segments are too big, then actually repairing a volume, you know, shipping data from another replica might take too long, right? Um, so Aurora chooses essentially the biggest size for fast, fast enough repair, right? So segments are, are 10 gigabytes in size. And on a, on a 10 gigabit you know, uh, um, network connection takes roughly 10 seconds um, to repair a, a segment. 
Um, we also provide, uh, we're, uh, the storage tier also um, provides quorum sets for replica uh, membership changes, right? So, you know, at a certain point, if we have, you know, at the top here, um, these six replicas, right? And where everything's healthy, right? And then at a certain point, we detect that F, um, uh, uh, replica F uh, is unhealthy, right? Or in suspect state. Um, uh, we can spin up a new, essentially uh, uh, define a new epic, epic two in this case, and bring up a new replica G, in, w in which case both F and G are, are currently active in the replica set, right? At a certain point in epic three, um, you realize that F is no longer needed, um, and then essentially you start in a new with a new set of uh, uh, with G as as the new member of the a replica set. Um, and, I'll, and I'll you know briefly you know cover what the, what the storage nodes does, does node does and and, and then um, and then conclude here right. So you know if you look at kind of again what a storage node does in Aurora right it's a replay machine right. So it receives the log records written from the primary instance. Um, it, 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 it writes them to an incoming queue, um, which is made durable, and at that point, it acknowledges um, back to the back to the primary instance um, that that everything is durable, right? And besides the in, in kind of behind the scenes, it's doing things like coalescing kind of the the, the hot piece of the log, um, redoing them on top of database pages, and writing the pages back to storage for durability, and then also backing up the data right for disaster recovery back to S3. And it's also doing kind of you know peer gossip group uh, um, between kind of peers, right? If 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 one if one set, if one replica um, is say missing a block or a hot log, it can share data with other nodes to be able to bring it up to bring it up to speed. But the key here is that essentially steps one and two are the are the the synchronous part. Like this is essentially the equivalent of the write ahead log durability um, ACK that that you need for transaction processing. Right? Um, and another, so in terms of kind of recovery, um, the key piece is here is, is that um, it de um, storage defines, there's a, there's a protocol between storage and, and compute, um, the segment uh, based on what's called the segment complete LSN, right? So this is effectively the SCL, is the low watermark um, uh, below which all, rec uh, all log records have been received and acknowledged by the storage tier, right? And they're maintained for each segment, you know, each storage node using essentially backlinks, Right, uh, used to identify holes or missing writes, right, which are filled in by the gossiping peers, right, um, and and essentially the the database knows about the SCL, right. This is essentially the the consistency point in the log, the kind of the global view of the log um, across the storage tier, right. Um, and then you know there's also a concept of a, a protection group complete LSN, right. So, um, and this can this can uh, advance after the DB after the essentially the database tier, right, um, sees the SCL advance um, at all four of six segments, right, and a volume complete LSN, right. So this is where, which is we call the VC or which was called the VCL, well, which can you know advance after the database sees um, uh, the PGCL advance um, to all protection groups, right? So this essentially provides the recovery point. So a commit in Aurora happens as follows, right? When the database can prove that all changes essentially have met quorum, right? So this ensures that the volume complete LSN is above, is greater than or equal to the commit LSN of the transaction. It's as simple as that, right? Um, and this is, you know, all, all transactions are asynchronously acknowledged, you know, so multiple transactions can, can you know, piggyback on on, on each other and so forth. So there's no flush consensus or grouping required here, right? Essentially, the database tier is waiting for, for the LSN marker to advance um, past the commit LSN before it acknowledges the transaction, All right? Um, and this allows kind of key features for, for essentially fast recovery, right? Um, so in traditional databases, as you, as you might have learned, right, um, you know, you can essentially checkpoint you checkpoint the pages up to a certain LSN, in which case you can truncate the log um, to be able to bound kind of redo um, or recovery time from, from the write ahead log, right? Um, in Aurora, essentially, the storage tier is, is the durable piece of the system, right? So in the storage tier is constantly redoing log in parallel, right, on, on the various segments, right? So, so really, you know, again, the job of the Aurora storage is to um, right, essentially redo log records, you know, on demand as part of a discrete or, you know, in, in parallel as, as in terms of uh, um, during regular processing. Um, and this is done in parallel distributed in asynchronous fashion, right? So there's no replay 
necessarily it's necessary at startup, right? If, if, if the database tier crashes and comes back, like essentially a new master, um, you know, there's a, there's essentially a recovery protocol that goes on as follows, right? So say at a certain point, you know, there's a, cons the, the, the database tier, you know, establishes a consistency point, again, which is increasing monotonically and, and continuously return to the database tier. And again, transactions can commit once the database can prove that all changes have met the quorum up to some LSN point. And again, this point is the volume complete LSN at the that is, which is the highest point, you know, where, where, where all records have met quorum, right? But there's also a point of a, a consistency point LSN, right? So these are things like uh, um, essentially the the the, um, the highest, essentially the highest commit record um, below the VCL, right? So so um, um, Aurora Aurora storage can handle things like system transactions, right? If you're if you're updating things like a B tree or splitting a B tree, where that has to be atomic across multiple pages. So if you're splitting a B tree. Um, you're writing a new page, updating an existing page, and updating the parent page. Um, that can be all done atomically um, and take in, and essentially uh, encoded as a as a consistency point, right? Um, uh, that only advances across system transactions, right? So everything. So on crash, right? And if the database were to come up, it would establish the CPL, um, and everything past the CPL is, is effectively deleted. Um, and, and no longer exists um, for the purposes of, of transaction processing at that point, right? So this removes the, essentially the need for, for two-phase commit uh, that might span storage nodes, right? And there's no redo or undo log processing necessary, right? Um, before the, the, the database is open and ready for processing. It simply attaches to storage, is, um, establishes the consistency point, and, and uh, the database is open for business, right? And of course, the, there are similar architectures that have followed this, this basic architecture. One is SQL Azure Hyperscale, uh, and the other is Alibaba um, Cloud and PolarDB, right? And systems like, certainly like Spanner um, um, follow a different architecture, but are, are in the same kind of you know, key workload for OLTP um, in the cloud. So with that, I'll conclude the talk and, and answer any questions, um, any more questions you might have. So thanks. Uh, any, uh, uh, question right up. So, uh, my question is actually about the compute network or mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes the low will actually try to figure out what the compute network is that we have. Actually, it's hyper traffic, and then you get from zero to 5,000 bytes per second. What we know this for is that it's always attempting to find the same thing. We're not sure what it does at all. But it never scales up till our work on it. So, I'm just wondering whether it waits for all transactions to finish up or some other. Uh, oh, so the question is, you you used Aurora Serverless to to the serverless version of Aurora to find a scaling point. Yeah, yeah I, I don't. We can take that one offline. I, I don't know. It, it might it might have been the the scaling point wasn't found fast enough. Right. Yeah. I mean, the serverless, the the public documentation says this as well. Like the 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 serverless version of Aurora does look for workload um, changes, right, to scale up and down appropriately, based on the resources used. Right. Any okay. Any other questions? Okay, so yeah. I have a few questions. Sure. So, uh, the first one. Do you, do you think there's a possibility, either possibility or a necessity, to have some sort of like a hybrid system like HTAP possible that can do both uh, efficiently, or whether that's even necessary? Yeah. The qu so the question is that OLT and Designs cloud. Is there some HTAP or hybrid system that can do it all? Right. I think you know. I don't know. The the verdict's still out. Um, we'll see if a system can be built like this. Um, my guess is, is if it were to happen, it would happen on the OLAP side. OLAP will look more like, you know, the HTAP system um, rather than kind of uh, you know what you do to 
evolve an OLTP system to become more OLAPy. Why? Different design primitives. Oh, so the design primitives. If you, you know a relational database like design, right? It's based on kind of fixed size pages, um, and the workloads there tend to be sticky, like more sticky than kind of OLAP. But again, that's just my guess. Um, anything can happen. But if you look at systems like like single store as well, right, which are which are going after this space, um, you know, they have interesting kind of built from scratch hybrid architectures as well. Um, but then, yeah, then again, the question is, you know, is that the is that the the right approach, right? Um, can you get away with a, two different systems um, that essentially do efficient CDC to each other, right? Change data capture, in which which the the, the database change log is shipped to the OLAP system. The OLAP system is now, you know, instantly updated or, or close to instantly updated for efficient querying. And another question I have is that um, you, you talk about this uh, new like service architecture, especially the, the pricing model in the cloud, right? You charge by a slot, essentially equivalent to uh, mm -hmm. resource consumption, right? Mm -hmm. So, wondering that would you have encountered any case that you could, for example, to make the queries become faster in a predictable way? But you may consume more resources, right? So in that case, uh, you may charge need to charge customer more money. Any encounter any of these cases? So right. So is yeah. I mean, in, in most serverless architecture, I think basically true now. In most serverless, like, right? Um, uh, the charging model is essentially some for some resource unit, right, right. For, for used to answer the query or, or perform the workload or so forth, right? right. Um, and the question is, what's the interplay between performance and, and using more resources, right? And the answer is, you know, usually throwing more resources at a problem, like, will make it run faster. The question is, how much do customers want to pay for it, right? In a perfectly scalable world, yeah, you can, you can pay all the money you want for a qu the query to answer, be answered in kind of one second as opposed to three seconds, right? The question is, does a customer want to stop paying for it? And that's usually a lever provided by most of these vCPU or, or, or virtual compute unit models, right? You can cap you know, a certain workload at, at, a, at a certain amount that you want to pay, and that's the maximum resources you're going to throw the problem. Okay, so you really do like that, that customer choose. Right. Uh, the customer, usually the, the, the model is the customer can provide a cap, say, like, look, I'm only willing to pay this much. Um, go do what you can. Okay. It's the, a simple but usually effective model. Another question? Yeah. I was curious about um, does the cost of moving data across the network significantly affect these architectures? So we heard about that last in our distributed database and stuff, but oh, sending data across the network is expensive compared to if you've just got one server in one building. So yeah. Like, I mean, it really depends. I mean, for, for OLAP, right, you're really throughput bound. So it's, it's it's bound by the kind of the throughput that you get off of off of storage, for things like um, you know more operational workloads that tend to be latency bound, queries tend to be smaller, in which case kind of reading reading data in a kind of a point wise fashion or smaller page based fashion across the network, yeah, will will affect the the performance more, right? So it really depends on kind of what type of system you're building at that point. It's a di different set of assumptions at that point. You know, usually you'd like, you know, in an OLTP system, you know, like Aurora, you'd like most data to be cached because an I.O. will cost you a network trip to go um, fetch an AK page, right? Another question? All right. All right. Uh, question, right? What's the next biggest challenge? Sorry? In, in What's the next biggest challenge that we're expecting in the solar economy? What are the biggest? Find me afterwards. Oh, hang on. There's a there's a long list of list of, of challenges. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, there always be a continuous challenge of of um, you know making things faster and more predictable. Right. Um, it's kind of an age-old optimization question, um, one that is you know clearly not solved across any system yet. I'd say that's that's far and above you know number one. All right, thank you. Yeah, this is awesome.
you see that um, many of the concepts that we discussed in class will definitely influence the, or like still be uh, would be useful in you know, in practice. But many of the assumptions could would, could break, right? And you can see uh, more challenges and in different contexts in the cloud driven by application. There are many many more challenges that you you need to deal with. So uh, there are still lots of exciting uh, problems that you could work on in this space. So uh, that's it. That's for today. And on Wednesday we'll have actually a pretty quick uh, final review. And then uh, good luck for the uh, rest of the homework projects and the exams. All right, that's it for today. Yeah, looking forward to see you guys on Wednesday. See you. About the St. Ives Brew, run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent. Plus, it's mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic onto my no fellow. Need for a mic check, bust it. The fees are set, then grab a 40. The flim the yoga snap is next. St. Ives. Take a sip, then wipe your lips. Cue my 40s getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E trouble, get us a St. Ives Brew on the double.